Thanks, Midge. Thanks, Tracy. And thank you all for coming. Yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about rain gardens. I thought I'd break the talk into two parts. First, I'd just talk generally about what is a rain garden, how it works, why you might want to do it. In the second half of the presentation, I'll talk a little bit about my rain garden. So a rain garden is a basin or a depressed area in the landscape that collects and filters stormwater. The soil at the bottom of the rain garden supports deep-rooted plants that, as you might guess, thrive in wet conditions. The garden often utilizes native plants. So why might you want to build one? First of all, storm water, um, storm water runoff is water from rain, snow, or something maybe you're doing in the yard, uh, empty your pool, uh, run the hose too long, things like that, that isn't absorbed into the ground. As it flows along, it can pick up pollutants over the impervious surfaces, so your driveway, the road, things like that. And these things flow into our streams, rivers, and eventually into Lake Erie. Some of the pollutants that it might pick up could be animal waste, oil and gas residue you know, from the roads, fertilizers you may have put on your yard and you know, the water washed it off, and chemicals, maybe uh, salt from our roads and things like that. So the rain garden captures this runoff and slowly releases this excess water by allowing it to infiltrate into the, the ground, to evaporate, and then also finally to be transpired through the leaves of the plants. There are a number of benefits of a rain garden. One is, in a heavy rain event, it reduces local flooding by capturing it and keeping it from just washing away. By doing that, it also reduces the burden on the treatment facilities. It filters some of the pollutants. And uh, depending on what you plant, it could provide a pollinator habitat and hopefully will be an attractive feature in your landscape. So to get started, the first thing you want to think about is where you might locate it in your Daddy. property. The most important thing, some of these are pretty obvious, um, you want to identify a water source. So maybe you want to locate yours near the house and have a downspout collect part of the water that hits your roof and send it to a rain garden instead of sending it to the uh, treatment facility. Maybe instead of that you have an area that you know, sloped yard and you just want it to flow and be held up for a while instead of just washing away. Obvious, but you have to remember that water flows downhill, so you don't want to locate your rain garden higher than your water source. Since you're going to be digging it, you want to avoid tree roots. They're hard to dig through. And you could also damage the tree by locating it too close to the roots of a tree. You want to check if there's any underground utilities. I haven't run into this, but they cautioned us when I took the course on this to check local regulations. Make sure it's okay to disconnect a downspout in your locality, if that's what you're going to do. And also, you don't want to locate it too close to a property line. I didn't write it here, but you don't want to build it right alongside your foundation either, or you might end up with a leaky basement as a result of this. And then something to think about. It's not a deal breaker one way or the other, but you might want to think about sun exposure. If you're in a very sunny area, that's going to say what kind of plants you can plant in the rain garden. If you're in a shady area, different plants are going to thrive. Then the next thing after you've decided where you're going to put it is how big should it be? And the size depends on two factors. One, how much rainwater, stormwater runoff you're actually going to collect. And two, how permeable your soil is. Will it just sit there for a week, or will it actually percolate into the soil? Now, measuring the area uh, for the water to be collected can be pretty easy, or it can be a little tricky. But I mean, let's say you wanted to connect, disconnect one downspout and just have the water from a portion of your roof flow into your rain garden. I mean, it could be as simple as just looking at the roof, seeing where from the peak to where that downspout collects, and just pacing it off, and then measure the length and width of that, you got the area. The percolation test I'll talk about on the next slide. Basically, you dig a hole about a foot in diameter, nothing magical about the diameter, and about 18 inches deep, and you fill it up with water from your garden hose. 
let it all drain into the soil, fill it up a second time, and then see how fast it um, drains into the soil that second time. If it drains in less than 24 hours, then the size of your rain garden should be about 20% of the area you're collecting stormwater from and be about four inches, four to six inches deep. If it takes longer, in other words, if your soil doesn't drain as well, then you're gonna to wanna to make it a little bigger in area and a little shallower. So I put an example here. Suppose you were collecting rain from a section of your roof that was 20 feet by 15 feet. You're just gonna take the downspout and instead of running it into the ground or you know, just, you're gonna direct it into this rain garden. Then the drainage area is 20 times 15 or 300 square feet. Let's just say that it took 18 hours for your perk test to drain. Then the result, the calculation would say, make my uh, rain garden 300 square feet times 20% or 60 square feet. Just, it could be any shape you want, but let's say six feet by 10 feet. And then that would also say we want a rain garden depth of four to six inches. So now, this isn't hard and fast. You can make it a little bigger, a little smaller. I wouldn't make it too much smaller. I mean, if you're collecting from uh, a large area of the roof and you make it you know, two feet by two feet, it's just gonna overflow whenever it rains. So you need to make it big enough, but don't, don't a lot of people get scared when there's any math, and I don't want you to get scared because this is the <laughs> easiest math on earth. So this is just a quick schematic, a sketch that I made that illustrates what a rain garden looks like in cross section. So you'll have the source, the water inlet, and in this case I just used a, a downspout, a pipe. You dig a basin, the size that you just calculated. One of the things you do with the stuff that you dug out of there is you create a little berm, a little mound around the outside, specifically the down wall, downhill side of your rain garden. The bottom of the basin you dug should be amended with compost or peat or something like that, some organic. And then um, generally you put a layer of mulch on top of that just to keep weeds down. The rain garden should have an outlet or an overflow. And um, I found that out the hard way. I'll show you a picture of that later. So once you've built that, that one slide made it look pretty easy, but it's a lot of digging. Next would be planting it. And I just put a few things down here that you might want to think about when you're selecting plants for a rain garden. I guess the first thing, the most obvious thing, is they have to be plants that thrive in a wet condition. Your rain garden will go from flooded underwater for a day or two to dry if we don't get any rain for a while. Within the rain garden, there'll be areas that are wetter and a little drier. So some of it, there's actually some nice tables, spreadsheets that uh, list plants that thrive under various conditions. Um, and if you dive into this deeper, you can access those through some resources I'll mention at the end. But then, of course, you want to talk about, um, am I going to need plants that like to be in the sun or the shade? Do I want flowers? If so, do I want to have them all bloom in the spring? Do I want to try to prolong it through the whole season? A lot of times, if you're putting your rain garden in the shade, flowers aren't as easy to identify. So you might want to look then about uh, uh, textures and shades of green and things like that. As I mentioned, there's a strong bias among this uh, rain garden community to use native plants. They're already well adapted for various conditions, and they're especially good for having pollinators because if you, if you mix your plant selection so that you have a good season of bloom, you'll attract pollinators throughout the summer. A lot of the emphasis these days is on uh, monarchs, so uh, there are a lot of plants that thrive in rain gardens that attract monarchs. And then I, this is kind of, uh, I don't know how to explain this, but you know, let's say you're building this rain garden and you have a patio over here and you want to look out at the rain garden and enjoy the beauty. You don't want to put all your tall things here and obscure everything on the other side. So they talk about a viewing angle. Think of where you're going to see it from when you're selecting the plants. I wish I could tell you it was a dig it and forget it, but there is some maintenance required. And of course, it depends on what, how lucky you are with what kind of year we get weather-wise. But if you plant a rain garden, you're planting plants that like wet conditions. 
the beginning of June this year, we went 18 days without a drop of rain. They, they would have all died if they were new. So you have to plan on maybe watering during the first year till they get those deep roots and can access uh, moisture that's deep in the ground. Uh, it's recommended to mulch every two years. A lot of these uh, plants that you'll choose go to seed, especially the natives, and you'll have volunteers springing up in your rain garden. And if you like where they are, that's great. And if they're somewhere you didn't want them, you're going to be pulling them out. So I found that it was good to put some stepping stones in the basin so you can step in there in case it's wet or muddy. I never thought of this, nobody told me this, but uh, this year after three or four years, the berm that I constructed had kind of eroded into the basin and there wasn't much of a wall around it anymore. So I had to kind of get in there with a hoe and bring it all back. This is another thing that I think is worth thinking about. They didn't, they didn't tell us this in the course, but I think you want to have a nice smooth contour, especially if you're the one mowing. You don't want to have like right angles that you got to go in and come in from the other side and all that. Just make it nice and smooth so you're making an easy path for mowing. And another piece of advice that uh, I didn't know about until I started doing this rain gardening is uh, they recommend to leave, they call it standing dead. So the, uh, the stems, the leaves, stuff like that on your perennials that uh, die back to the ground over the winter. They say to leave them in there and that provides a habitat for beneficial insects and I imagine also some non-beneficial ones. But. <laughs> so now I'll talk about my rain garden. This is the site before I built the rain garden. There were all those really good things for the environment reasons to build a rain garden. I was a little more on the dark side. I had a problem that I had to solve and if it was doing some good, great, but I had a problem. The problem was when we built this gazebo, this gazebo doesn't have a foundation, so supplier recommended that we put down this bed of crushed stone. So uh, we had a guy come out and he dug out all the sod. His guys tamped down that soil so hard that it didn't drain at all. And so then when we put in the crushed stone and these landscape timbers, it just held water. It was like a swimming pool full of gravel. And it trickled out very slowly and all of these garden beds around it were saturated with water. They were waterlogged. Well, I had half a good idea but didn't really see it through all the way. When the guys were doing the site prep, I said, why don't we put in a drain pipe? So there was a drain pipe that went from the back of this to this corner and it was capped so it didn't drain. It was a pipe there, but it didn't drain. So as a result, it was really wet. It was wet all around it, but particularly here because this was the shadier side. That's a little rhododendron, and if you look close, you can see it's dying. It, it didn't survive the one season. It was too wet. So as it happened, we got something, an email from the Chagrin River Watershed Project. Partners, partners about a rain garden. My wife said, boy, you ought to do this, see if this will help this. So I did. I'm skipping ahead in the process, but one of the early things you do if you take the, uh, the program is to kind of come up with a, a sketch of what you think you'll do, you bring it into class. The instructors and your classmates kind of go, oh, well, did you think of this? How about that? Blah, blah, blah. So that was my sketch. That's what I decided I was going to do. And you can see here I've located the gazebo and it has some dimensions. So if you go back to my calculation, my, my soil did drain in 24 hours, and I said I was basically connected, collecting rainwater from a 14 foot by 14 foot area. So I don't remember what that is offhand, but I calculated that I needed about a 70 square foot basin, and I made this 9 feet by 8 feet or something like that. And again, I'm skipping ahead, I, I actually rented a sod cutter for half a day, it took an hour. They're, they're beasts and they work great. But I cut all that sod out of there and this is actually the sod turned upside down to make the berm. So you see some grass poking through but it basically dies when you put your sod upside down like that. Or what doesn't die is easy to pull out. My soil has a tremendous amount of rocks in it so I just kind of collected them off to the side and you'll see later I just kind of decorated the, uh, the perimeter of the garden with them. This here is, you can't see it real well, but that's a hole I dug when I found that pipe that was capped. 
I then continued that pipe right into here. I think I have a picture. Oh, no. Okay, so <laughs> I didn't put an overflow in this. And within two days, we had one of these rains of the century, you know, that we have every month now. The, the, the entire basin filled up and just overflowed over all the berm. And you can see, you can see it there, it's fill, filled with water. I just basically got a shovel and dug a, a, a trench to my, the garden along the woods. And as it happened, the garden along the woods is on a gentle slope down, and all of this water drains the entire length of my backyard and kind of slowly percolates in so that by the time it gets to the other side of the yard, it was all absorbed. So just to make it permanent, uh, I put in a piece of drain pipe and covered it with gravel. And this is what it looked like one year after. And I can tell you a little bit about what's in there. This is a blue flag iris, and it is a native. It's a terrific plant, and if anyone were building a rain garden, I would highly recommend it. It thrives in the wettest area of my rain garden. These here, you can't see them real well, are uh, Stokes asters, and they're right next to the iris in the west, wettest part of the garden. They look terrific for about a month. Their flowers are terrific. Behind it, and you can't really see it, but right behind the iris is, um, what do they call it, snowberry, the deciduous holly that has the red berries in the winter. And I should say that, you could select flowers, shrubs, grasses. Some people even plant trees in their rain garden. This is Baptisia. I love the plant. Um, it, it behaves a little different in a rain garden than if you saw it like in, in my uh, wood, woodland garden here. In the rain garden, it's very slow to wake up in the spring. It, I don't see it. In fact, I wonder if it survived the winter until well into June. And then it comes on like gangbusters. Here is butterfly weed. And back here, again, you can't see it because the iris is covering it up, is swamp milkweed. So uh, I do get monarchs in the garden. Um, not as much as I hoped, but uh, it's something. We're trying to get the monarchs to come back, right? So that's kind of the end of it. If anyone's interested in, in taking this further, uh, I would highly recommend these resources. This is um, the Chagrin River Watershed Partners. They're in downtown Willoughby. They put on a course, actually I think they do it three times a year. The one I took, and I don't know if they're all like this anymore, was four classes one week apart. Uh, and each class was about four hours. It was a nice group of people, uh, you know, classmates. There were a few uh, professional landscapers taking it. And um, then, of course, the staff that taught it, they were just excellent and so enthusiastic. They have a handout that, uh, that, that I, I found it online, but I don't know if it's widely available or if they just let me look at it because I told them I was doing this, called Rain Gardens 101. Um, and it's, it's very detailed and very informative. Um, and they also, uh, if you take the course, there's something called an MRG Master Rain Gardener course pack that's maybe, oh, 15, 20 pages, and it takes you through it step by step. It's sort of the textbook if you take that four-week course. They have a Facebook page if you just kind of want to see what it's like, get some more pictures other than just mine, and get a feel for what the community is like. I uh, can't say enough good about these folks. They're really uh, enthusiastic and helpful. And... Um, they kind of want to keep the whole group together for years and years and years. So like this year, they have a, a volunteer appreciation event. And you know, it it's kind of becomes a little piece of your social life if you care to make it so. So that's it. Um, I'll open the floor to any questions. Um, you might have said it, but I missed it. Um, perhaps so you, if you build a holy dig with well, water and it drains for 24 hours, do you then do the same thing the next day, or do you have any time in between the second fill? So the, the, Judy asked about the percolation test. And the way it works, I mean, you don't know what the weather's been like when you do this. You don't say, I'm going to wait till it's a nice day or a bad day or something like that. So you kind of try to make it equal. What you do is you dig the hole, you fill it with water, all that water gets absorbed, and right away you fill it right back up again so that everything around it is wet but now you get a true feel for how, how uh, permeable your soil is, how well your soil drains. Yes? Is there any difference between septic and sewer? You, what do you mean, in what context? Drainage or, I mean, 
Oh, oh, so I, I, uh, I, I, I uh, we have sewer where I am, but uh, I, I understand uh, it's uh, not recommended to do this too close to a septic field, but I don't know other than that. Okay, thank you. Yeah? 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 I'm, I'm wondering um, if you can um, improve it, improve the rain garden itself by digging deeper and putting a base of bubbles. Uh, the question was, can you uh, make the uh, rain garden more effective by digging it deeper and putting a base of pebbles? So I know you, you, you kind of get out of rain garden into things like bio swales and things like that, engineered uh, systems. This they keep a lot simpler. They don't talk about that at all in, in designing it. They, they basically give you a, uh, hmm, a method that should work. Uh, and, and when I say should work, I mean if you had very poor drainage in that percolation test and you built something that um, uh, collected a lot of water and didn't take it off, you might have a, a, a very wet condition persist for longer than you want. Or like I showed in my one picture, it could overflow uh, if you get too much all in one day. Um, I don't know about the pebbles at the bottom. I know that when, you know, like if, you're, if you see a construction of a commercial building and they're building a drainage system, uh, you know, a, uh, what do they call them? Retention. Detention or retention pond, yeah. That those are often engineered and they have systems at the bottom to control in, in case of those once in a century events. Uh, but for these, I don't know anyone that did that. And I'll tell you what, too, if you're digging this thing, you, you are not going to be fond of digging an extra six <laughs> inches <laughs> to put so in some more what stones. What I'm saying is the key is how well these plants yes. utilize water. These plants are going to be... That's, that's part of it, for sure. I, I think you want to size it at least in the neighborhood of the right size for the amount of water you're going to collect. Um, you know, I, I saw when we had some field trips when I was taking the class, I saw some rain gardens that were maybe three feet by four feet, but they were just collecting rainwater that ran off of a front walkway or something like that. And they were fine. And if they overflowed, big deal. You know, but um, if, if you were collecting like the entire surface of your roof into a three by four foot thing, you'd have a disaster. So it really matters how, how well your, your soil drains. And... Um, I, I, don't, I don't know how much you're going to improve it by adding gravel or pebbles on the bottom unless it's being conducted somewhere else. In a, in a way, you're just making it deeper. So, yeah. I was Susan. just wondering, Alan, you said that they, uh, you, you plant uh, deep-rooted plants. Yeah. I would think the pebbles would get in the way of those they could. roots being able to get down. That could be true. I hadn't long. thought of that. Yeah. Uh, because that's one of the advantages to native plants is that Deep, deep roots. Much longer roots than, yeah. than others. Yeah, I know that Baptisia in particular has incredibly deep roots. If, if I ever wanted to transplant it, forget about it. I, it has a tap root and you'd, you'd break it, yeah. Yes? Um, so that, the, the example you gave of the three foot, foot by four, which yeah. is just the natural overflow of yeah. water coming down is kind of what, what were you right. Sure. The base of that slope now, and sure. it, that base that slope intersects with the driveway and the sidewalk, and we were kind of wondering what precautions and, and, and is it okay to do a rain garden like right at the, like close to like cement, and what should you be cautious about doing that in those kind of areas? Yeah, I, I think it probably could just, you know, without knowing the specifics and, and uh, you know, all the details. But I know a lot of people in the class did something very similar to that, uh, build it along a driveway or even along the, the road. And uh, I, I would say the only thing you want to make sure of is, again, because I had the problem, I, I think you want to provide an overflow. And one thing to think about there uh, might be, I mean, if you're, <laughs> let's say you're doing it along your driveway and you have an overflow, and it's winter, <laughs> you're just going to ice your entire driveway. So you got to think those things through about where's the best place to make an exit. That's where when you're yeah. And we already have that issue, like in the winter. 
Yeah. It's already ICP. Yeah. So this might help. Yeah. Depending on how you arrange it, it might help. Yeah. 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 What kind of slope do you need on your drainage pipe to get to your rain garden? Off the, the question was, what kind of slope do you need on the drain pipe to reach the rain garden? Off the top of my head, I don't remember. Um, I know it's in these resources. Um, now, mine, uh, really from that gazebo to the rain garden, is only about six feet. So I, I overdid it. I, I put, you know, a few inches of drop in it. Mm -hmm. But um, the other thing I did, if you want to get into a little particulars, I put, we have so many chipmunks and stuff, I put those uh, perforated caps on it to keep anything from crawling up in there and also on the overflow. Um, but I, I think kind of normal plumbing guidelines are all you have to follow because uh, the worst thing that's going to happen is freezing in the winter. So you want to make sure it runs out. And it, being a pipe, it'll run out, it'll drain completely, you know. The overflow might not, you know, it might hold some. Yeah. Go ahead, Brittany. Okay. Uh, so realistically, how long would something like the size of your garden take to do? Is this a, a, a long weekend project? Is this over a month? Like, how, how long did it take you to get your, your finalized project? Sure. Sure. The question was, how long did it take to do my rain garden? So there's a lot that I would say it depends. I, I thought it was a great help get renting a sod cutter. If you had to dig up 70, 80 square feet of sod with a shovel, A, you're going to be pretty sore. Well, you're young, but I would have been pretty sore. <laughs> and um, so that, that was a t big time saver. I had all the sod cut in an hour. And um, in fact, I had some nasty areas of grass in my yard. I cut them out too and took the stuff I had just dug up and transplanted it over there. So. Um, Digging it took me the better part of a day, uh, mostly because I have so many rocks in my soil. And um, where do you take that soil when you dig it? You know, you, you use some of it to build the berm, but you're going to have more soil, a bigger hole than you have a place to put it all. So if you have low spots, if you have a, you know, an area in the woods, something like that. So you're going to be wheelbarrowing it. Um, so that's a time element. Um, but once that was done, connecting up the pipe and everything was really pretty easy. I was kind of a nut. I didn't want to see a white PVC pipe, so I painted it brown. And, um, Those are the things yeah, you yeah. About, but when you ask how long it takes, that adds a day because you've got to wait for the paint yeah. to dry and all that. Okay. And then part of the fun was shopping for the plants and deciding what to get and yeah. planting them. I mean, I, I think there was probably, when I started it, maybe eight. 10 plants in there, so that wasn't a big time saver. From soup to nuts, I was done in a month, but I could have been done in three or four days if I had compressed everything. Sure. Yeah? Does yours always have water in it? No, 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 it does not. After a strong rain, it will have water in it, maybe an inch or two deep. It rarely overflows, though it has. Um, this summer it has a couple of times. Um, and uh, I haven't watered it because now after four or five years, everything is well established. But um, I, I, I really think that's good advice to, to know that if you're planting. Now, another good piece there is to plant in the fall when the weather's changing and it's going to be a little moister. Um, and they'll get a chance. If you plant it like around now, they'd get a good root system developed over the winter and be good in the spring. But um, no, I, it doesn't uh, typically. So uh, adding fish doesn't help. No, 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 no. It was funny, before we did it, there was enough of a puddle that a frog moved in. But <laughs> he was gone the day we connected the drain pipe. Yes, again in the back. Um, what do you suggest if you have to go underneath concrete to get to the drain Yeah, well, they actually talk about that in the course, and they talk about using... Um, I may be asking, answering a slightly different question, but if you have to go under the concrete, a, a sidewalk or something like that was the question. And they suggested running PVC pipe with a pop-up. You know what I mean by a pop-up? There's these things that it's flush with the ground, and then when the rain comes, it forces a little cap up in the air, and all the water kind of spills out. So um, completely unrelated, I have one of those under my front walk. When, when we built the house, we had it installed because the builder put the downspouts on one side of the front walk, and all the water was just going to run across the walk, and that's what I was talking about, ice and stuff like that. Yeah? Sidebar, how do you get that to 
What, get what? Uh, good question. I, I, I had the builder do it, so I don't know. <laughs> yes? So you mentioned maintenance, and it's kind of along the lines of the question he asked about the water in there. Yeah. Do you find that, do you ever have the water, even though yours is well established, or once it's established, it's pretty maintenance free in that respect of the water that needs to be in there at any time? Right. The question was, do I ever have to water anymore? No, never. In fact, I had a sprinkler head that was nearby, and I actually turned it off. I, I don't use it at all. Um, and the maintenance, like I said, I, knock wood, um, I don't even have to weed it very much. I just have to take out the volunteers. The, I, I do have a lot of uh, the Baptisia. I have little Baptisias this tall now. and um, Milkweed uh, spre spreads pretty. Yeah. Now, so the swamp milkweed is a little easier to control than common milkweed. Um, I don't get a lot of stuff coming from rhizomes. I just get the seeds that fall and germinate. Don't you go after those pods on the milkweed? I do when I think of it. Some get away from me. <laughs> Anything else? Jackie? Well, it, it, the, I actually looked it up this morning to see. It's 18 inches deep, and how wide? It says the width of a shovel, so whatever you dig the hole with, you know. The, the basic idea is that it's going in around the sides and out the bottom, or through the bottom. It's infiltrating into the surrounding soil. Yeah, a lot of this, there's guidelines, but I got to tell you, they aren't that strict. I mean, if you made it 17 inches deep, come on, you know, no big deal, yeah. Okay, well thank you, thank you all for coming. Mm -hmm.